Uh, uh, yeah, I was, uh, Michael invited me to speak in this uh, back in the fall, and this is just another indication of how old I am. I, uh, I thought, wow. I was, I just lectured in that seminar, didn't I? Uh, and uh, just this morning, I finally looked up and said it was 2010, so it was before you were here, uh, before James was here, when Clemmer was on the faculty here and others, so, and, and none of you heard me talk about that, but it was all about my work in autism and stuff, and today's gonna be uh, absolutely no, over well, there's a small overlap with, with, in the autism space, uh, but it plays a minor role here. But let me tell you about uh, what I'd like to talk about. Um, I'm gonna quickly kind of revisit the initial inspiring vision that, that James talked about, Mark Weiser's uh, definition and inspiration for ubiquitous computing, which was one of the reasons why I shifted gears when I became a faculty member at, at Georgia Tech and moved more toward this style of, of research. And uh, then I'll use that initial kind of inspiration to motivate at an area that I've been working on with a number of colleagues for the last three years now in an area I call computational materials, and I'll demonstrate some examples. I was gonna give some live demos here, but because I don't have enough shielding of my cables and the, these podiums have a lot of electrical wires, um, you would just hear a lot of uh, 60 hertz hum if I did the thing, so I can show things uh, uh, to people um, afterwards if they're interested. Um, I'll give uh, five different examples of some technologies that we've developed over the last uh, year and a half, it turns out, and then uh, um, return to why these technologies might be interested to give you a flavor of some application ideas and then round it out with some general uh, lessons talking about this work on a, a multidisciplinary team that refers to itself as Cosmos. So let's start by revisiting uh, Weiser's original vision, and I sure hope with people in an HCI seminar that you've read uh, um, this article by uh, Mark Weiser. If you haven't, that's your homework for tonight. You can forget everything uh, um, I say and just read this uh, particular article. But those that uh, have read it would recognize this as the very first sentence. And for extra credit and free lunch, can anyone tell me what the very next line in that article was? They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they become indistinguishable from it, right? That, um, Weiser meant this metaphorically at the time. His idea was that we're gonna be able to create these computational devices in a variety of different shapes and sizes, and we'll have so many of them that you will no longer consciously think about, is that a computer or not? And so they will vanish from your consciousness in the same way that other technologies, like the electric motor or like language and writing as technologies have become so pervasive that we don't think about them consciously as, as technologies. So while Weiser meant that uh, metaphorically, I think when you, uh, a really good uh, strategy, particularly for students when you're thinking about uh, trying to define a research agenda, is go back a few decades and look at visions from the past and reinterpret them in today's context. So let's do that exercise here and reinterpret what it might mean to weave things, weave themselves, you know, profound technologies, Weiser was referring co to computing. So how might we weave computing into the fabric of everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it? So that's the kind of uh, recasting of that idea. And I'll just throw a, a potentially silly idea out there. What would it mean if I could take a post-it note, write on it, and put a little button on there, and put that on my door when I leave, and the instructions say here, please tap and speak your message to Gregor. You simply tap that piece of paper, and magically, what, uh, uh, you can speak a message that's left for Gregory. So that's the kind of idea of a computational capability that is more like physical objects that we have in our everyday world. And that might seem fanciful, but I'm hoping I'm gonna demonstrate to you that that really is not that far-fetched given what we can do today with various materials. So I'm gonna use that motivation to talk about what I'm calling computational materials. And I'm not gonna define the computational materials until the end of the talk. I'm gonna define them by giving you examples and then by showing you how they might be used. And then we'll step back and talk about what I mean by a computational uh, material. Okay, so one of the problems of Weiser's vision, as prophetic as it was, that we don't really have ubiquitous computing. We don't have computing everywhere. This has virtually no computational capability. This floor has no computational capability. That podium, uh, it's, it has some technologies embedded within it, but the, the surface there is in no way a computational. So we don't really have 
uh, computing throughout our physical world in a way that uh, um, uh, wiser, you might interpret uh, wiser's vision to be. Uh, and why is that? Well, I think there are three problems with computing that, for, that prevent it from being uh, ubiquitous. And those become kind of the driving design factors for computational materials. The first, no uh, secret to anyone, is power. Uh, um, the more you want things to be small and you want them to be mo mobile, the harder it is for them to be uh, uh, computational in the sense that, that, that usually requires the, the consumption of power. So power is a, a big constraint. No secret to anyone who does wearable or mobile computing. Cost. Despite what you might think about the wonders of Moore's Law, since the mid-60s to, eh, depending on what charts you look at, the end of last decade or the middle of this current decade, uh, um, it dramatically reduced the price of the computing device, uh, a, a transistor, but it's nowhere near as cheap to produce computing devices as it is to produce other kinds of artifacts that we have in our everyday life, like the fibers in that carpet, carpet or the uh, drywall or paper or even glass. Right, we have, or gasoline, or molecules, uh, uh, chemicals that we use in the medical. Those are much cheaper to manufacture, largely because they take a different approach to manufacturing. They're less about tightly integrated processes that all have to be perfect in order to get a good output. And they take more the notion of, let's use chemical engineering techniques to manufacture a large number of things and then use other properties to filter out the objects that have the properties that we want, which is a different way of thinking about manufacturing than has existed and then what underpins Moore's Law, which is better and better, more complex, integrated manufacturing processes. So cost is an issue. And probably most importantly is form factor. You can probably identify something that's computational because it looks like a computer, looks like a, an integrated circuit chip. You, you can recognize them. This doesn't look like a computer to you, and so you don't think it is a computer. So how do we create form factors of computational things that look more like everyday objects or by attaching them to everyday objects, they don't change the look of those objects themselves. So let's take those three factors and use those as kind of driving design goals for a new kind of te technology that we want to be able to create or invent, right? We want to never have to change a battery. And I would say beyond that, we don't have the luxury of plugging in uh, uh, to power. We want it to be cheap to produce at large scale so as cheap as it is to produce uh, uh, drywall or reams of paper. And the form factor, they should look like everyday materials, or if you attach them to existing everyday materials, don't change what those materials look like, or even how they behave uh, um, from a physical perspective. So how do we get there? I think one of the ways we get there is we have to think differently about what a computing device is and we shouldn't be shackled by assumptions about what the measures of success for computing should be. It's not always the case that you advance yourself by thinking about, from Moore's Law perspective, that things should always be cheaper and smaller, and I can package them uh, 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 in, in a, a different kinds of packages uh, or smaller packages. It also shouldn't be the case that in order to communicate, uh, do wireless communication, the measure of success is that I can either shoot it further or I can, I can send more at once. Those aren't always the measures of success that lead you to the uh, more creative kinds of ideas. I'm going to come back to this idea at, at the very end. But the other thing is to seek influence from, and this is talking to designers and computer scientists, seek influence from disciplines that we don't necessarily seek influence from today. And I'll show you some examples of uh, influence from uh, material science, from uh, uh, organic electronics, uh, from thinking about nanomanufacturing of high performance devices, electrochemistry, and advanced additive manufacturing techniques. So now, computation of materials. Let me give you some examples of what I consider to be a new way of thinking about what a computer is. And um, I'm going to give you five examples. I won't talk about the one down at the bottom unless someone is interested in it. So I'll, I'll jump right into these uh, five different examples. Some of them have some videos. Some of them have some props I can talk about. And we'll see how time, what time lets me do. So the first one is a project called uh, Saturn. And the idea here is we want to produce an acoustic or vibration sensor. Uh, but we want it to be self-sustainable in the sense that it doesn't require 
uh, um, well, the, the power source it requires is the phenomenon that it's sensing, in this case, the uh, um, sound or vi a vibration. So generate energy from those things. So that, in that sense, it's self-sustainable. But it also has to be made of relatively simple materials with relatively simple manufacturing processes. And uh, as such, it could then be easy to deploy. So you'll see an example here of one of our prototype uh, Saturn patches that's a thin and flexible multi-layer material. Now, how does this work? So this is where we get a little inspiration from material science folks. Um, anyone here, unlike James and me, and actually has long enough hair that when you uh, uh, take a plastic comb through your hair and you move the comb, uh, comb away from it, what happens? The hair comes with you, right. But because there's an exchange of charge between the two, yeah, okay. You, you we'll wait a couple years, Michael. Uh, um, the, there's an exchange of charges between the plastic of the comb and the hair. In this case, that's a dog's hair or, or human hair. And so it turns out any two materials demonstrate this exchange of charge property. But certain pairs of materials are so far apart in terms of their desire to attract positive charge or a negative charge when they come in contact with another one that if you take ones that are far enough apart here, you can actually take advantage of that electrostatic uh, field that gets, that gets built up. So in this case, we've got hair and the floral polymer that's the plastic in the comb. Now let me give you a quick uh, uh, tutorial on how you can harvest this phenomenon to produce an alternating current. So in uh, this Saturn project, and I've got the prototype right here, it's mounted in this uh, um, wood frame, there are four layers. You've got paper on the top. This is the paper. The paper has a pattern of holes in it, uh, for reasons I'll explain uh, later, if at all. Uh, and then it's coated with copper. And then there's a plastic PTFE, and this, this one has a different plastic PEF, but a fluoropolymer, and it also has copper on its one side. What we're interested in is the relationship between the copper on the top and the plastic on the bottom there, and what happens when they come in contact and separate. So when they come together, there is, a, and upon separation, there's an exchange of charge between the copper and the plastic, the copper uh, getting the po positive charge and the uh, PTFE or the uh, flu fluoropolymer getting the negative charge. When you separate them, you now have an electric charge, electric field between those two surfaces. If you provide a way for the positive charge in that copper to flow, you could balance that electric charge. That's why we have the copper on the, on the bottom of the, uh, of the PTFE. So if we connect those two electrodes, we provide a path to balance the electric field. If we continue to do that, what results, this combination of the triboelectric exchange of charge and the electrostatic induction, that is the balancing of those charge, you continue to do that. This is what's called a triboelectric nanogenerator, which was invented by my colleague uh, Z.L. Wang at Georgia Tech in material science. So that inspired us to think, how might we take advantage of that charge by introducing a vibrational source that can then uh, reproduce some signal that you might that might be meaningful and a good vibrating source is human the human voice so if you design this multi-layer material appropriately you can enhance the micro vibrations between the uh, copper and the plastic and you can essentially produce an alternating current the amplitude of which mimics the amplitude of the voice so you have a sensor an acoustic sensor that doesn't require any external power other than the power of the signal it's trying to uh, uh, interpret. So your voice provides the energy. Um, I was gonna show you a demo, but we have uh, unshielded wires here. But with this particular device, I can sit it here and I can stand back here and I can speak in my regular voice and you would hear uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the signal that's retrieved from this would, be, would reproduce, reproduce my voice. If you don't believe me, we can set it up outside. I did it just outside before, and uh, we'll show you what it looks like. I could do it here, but it would sound like 60 hertz hum, which is not, well, it's not entirely unlike my voice, but it's not exactly my voice. Um, I won't show this particular demo because I got a lot of different things to, uh, uh, um, uh, to talk to you about, and we'll come back later if people want to see uh, um, particular uh, demos here. Um, one of the things you could do with this, rather than just recording voice, is you can say, well, is it possible that you can generate enough energy here that you could do more than just record the signal? So if you have enough incident sound, 
in terms of its amplitude incident on this particular patch, can you produce enough energy that would allow you to do something computational? In this case, the simplest thing is could you flip a bit in, um, in flash memory? And the paper that uh, this is about, which I'll show, I think was on the earlier slide, uh, um, demonstrates the calculation to show that you actually can uh, produce enough energy to flip a bit. And that's interesting because that means that you can place it in an environment and it can record whether sound levels went over some particular threshold. And there are lots of uh, um, military and non-military applications of something like that. But that, that I just showed you, that Saturn is just an acoustic sensor, right? So in and of itself, it, not all that interesting. There's not much you can do with it. I showed one simple thing you could do is you could flip a bit. Maybe you can generate enough energy to do some other things, but you typically can't generate enough energy to wirelessly transmit some information. So to do that, you need to use another trick for passive uh, communication. And this is not something we invented, but is, is known in the literature of passive forms of wireless communication that use the backscatter phenomenon of radio frequency. So if you attach an antenna to this patch and put a simple transistor, a JFET transistor between the patch and the antenna, then you can, uh, um, modulate the reflected RF signal, and that modulated signal can essentially, amplitude mo uh, uh, modulation, can reproduce the um, acoustic signal that was received that's incident upon the patch and communicate it wirelessly over some distance. So just to show you very quickly what that means, this is a, a demo that was just done We a present days ago. our work Zeus, the zero energy ubiquitous sound sensing surface. Our setup consists of an RF transmitter, receiver, and Zeus patch placed at a distance. The transmitter broadcasts a carrier wave at 915 megahertz, which is received in amplitude modulated by the Zeus patch in the presence of slight vibrations, like speech or touch. The modulated signal is backscattered to the receiver, and the audio information captured by the patch is extracted. Let's look at an example. Hi Stanford, this is demonstration for Zeus, zero energy ubiquitous sound sensing surface. Hi Stanford, this is demonstration for Zeus, zero energy ubiquitous sound sensing surface. That's the raw signal. You can do some processing to clean up uh, so, uh, some of that noise, but that's just a raw signal that was actually uh, recorded just last night. Uh, um, so let's go on to another example. So that's an example of a thin, flexible, multi-layer material that has the ability to uh, record vibration uh, and uh, uh, with uh, additional technology can communicate that information over some distance. So let's take that same idea of the triboelectric nano generator and use a very different form factor. This is something, uh, this is, we, will be presented at uh, the CHI conference in a, a month or two. Uh, this is a series of layers of silicone and conductive thread that are uh, wrapped in a coil around uh, the silicone. And you've got uh, uh, three different ways triboelectric interaction happens here. Uh, fingers can touch the silicone and exchange charge, so you can you could uh, uh, produce a charge with that movement, uh, and deforming it will cause a, a certain kind of change. So this quick video here will talk a little bit about what this is used for. We introduced Serpentine, a self-powered, reversibly deformable cord sensor. Using principles of triboelectric nanogenerators, Serpentine senses mechanical deformations without an external power source. Serpentine can detect six unique human interactions, pluck, twirl, stretch, pinch, wiggle, and twist. Serpentine can be integrated into applications like a hoodie string as a music controller and a slingshot as a game controller. Okay. So those are two examples of what I'll refer to as a self-sustainable sensor. It uses the uh, uh, phenomenon that it's trying to sense, vibration or sound, or the manipulation or deformation of a cord as the source of energy, and, and both use the same phenomenon, triboelectric nanogeneration. Yes, James. So I wonder, um, do you have applications where you do need to do some communication like the, the RFID backscatter? Because in that case, you can just power harvest that energy to you know, run 
more traditional sensors. So I'm wondering right. So, what so what, what I've been showing these is, is as sensors. You're talking about what I might do to use these simply as harvesters to do other things. And that's actually the way you want to start to think about these things. They don't have to be sensors. They can be harvesters if they're in the presence of the phenomenon. Uh, so, for example, I'll talk a little bit about this. I'm going to communicate it with RFID. I could already just harvest the RFID energy to run a traditional microphone or other sensor rather than have to it's build a different the same solution. sensor. Yeah, it's a, well, it's also much cheaper, simpler materials, and a form factor. Infrastructure is. Well, if you do, but so that's what I'm saying. Are there good applications where I don't need? That um, I think the answer to that is yes, and I'll come to a series of of those kinds of applications. But it's it's not just an application that you couldn't otherwise do with conventional ones, but the fact that you can actually do it at much larger scale uh, with, with these solutions uh, is, is one of the ways to think about that. But that's a good kind of a challenge to, uh, to be thinking about. But the general idea for self-sustainable sensing is how can you uh, in, uh, identify a phenomenon that you want to sense and use that phenomenon as the means of powering the way you're going to sense and potentially compute actuate or communicate uh, the information after that. So what are some other examples? I'm going to show you this first one, detecting water. That's a project that's currently in progress. Things that haven't been explored yet, but I think can work with the same idea is how might you detect ammonia, which is sometimes an indicator of spoilage of food, and how might you uh, uh, detect smoke? Uh, so, and I'll, I'll talk roughly about what this means about being able to produce easily deployed battery-free sensors in a variety of different places that you can't do that easily today. So let's take the example of water. So how do we uh, design a sensor that will generate power in the presence of water and use that power to do something? In this case, we're going to use the power to communicate, to identify water is here, but you could do other things uh, um, as well. So we're going to use the power for wireless communication. And on top of that, you've got to make it durable, and you've got to make it easy to deploy in the places where you want to detect water leakage. So for example, in talking to uh, uh, construction uh, folks, uh, roofs are places where we want to detect leaks, and basements are places where we want to detect leaks. And we want to be able to do it in the process of building the, those environments or by adding it as a retrofit. So uh, battery 101. I apologize to those who probably know way more than I do about this electrochemistry. This is very simple. Uh, but a battery essentially has a, 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 ca a cathode and an anode and uses an electrolyte between those two to essentially cause some kind of chemical reaction that, that induces the flow of charge from one end to the other when you, when you uh, uh, put a load across the anode and the cathode. So in the presence, in the absence of electrolyte, it's, a, it's inert. Nothing happens. But when you have the electrolyte, then the battery is engaged. So the idea here is how can we build a battery as a thin material that when it gets in the presence of something that acts as a, an electrolyte will activate the battery. That's the very simple idea. And here's a, an initial kind of demonstration of this capability. That's just a, a simple prototype that we built a, a month or two ago. It's aluminum foil with a number of, with uh, something laid on the on one side of the aluminum, a plastic mesh that separate, separates that uh, uh, layer from the layer on the bottom that has a different uh, uh, chemical that's uh, sprayed onto it that will give you the cathode and anode effect. It's got holes in it, it's perforated, which means when water comes to one side, it will soak between the two layers and produce power because it's activated uh, the chemical reaction. It's, it's produced the, uh, the electrolyte. So a very simple idea. Uh, um, to, to allow us to produce this kind of uh, um, water-activated battery, connect that to, it produces enough power uh, to uh, power a standard uh, BLE beacon, or you could have a printed uh, uh, specialized wireless communication that, that it will do. And we have demonstrations of this, and we're uh, uh, further characterizing that now. And you'll read this soon uh, um, in some uh, journal of choice uh, in the future. Now I'm going to talk about another example of some work in progress, and this is how do we produce uh, surfaces that are cheap to produce, they're paper-like, um, and can provide interactive capabilities. And the interactive capability we're going to uh, introduce now is just being able to detect where you touch on that surface. So imagine an N by M grid, and I can determine when I touch anywhere on one of those cells, but I can also swipe across here and get a series uh, of touches and wirelessly communicate that information so that it can then cause something to happen somewhere in the world. So 
I'll show a, a quick video here uh, um, that demonstrates these uh, uh, particular features of how it works. And I'll describe what's not clear. Mm -hmm. Piezoelectrics are a common other example. Right? Yep. Uh, uh, and in fact, there's very interesting. Yeah, there we go. So those are some of the parameters for what you're trying to do here. And we'll have something like a cat whisker that you'll see that's using FM ambient backscatter in order to be able to communicate. This is just a simple printed surface. So that's the schematic of it. Now you'll see the crufty looking uh, 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 prototype. FM, ambient FM and using the FM receiver on a smartphone uh, uh, to communicate. So there's the crufty prototype, the little touch surface, the simple circuitry on a breadboard, the power harvesting. So this is uh, operating at less than 100 microwatts of, of power. And then the smartphone that is the FM receiver of the backscatter. Now you'll see Anand, my student, walk up, touch somewhere here. And you, there's not so great contrast, but you'll see a little X appear where it's uh, indicated where he's touching. All right, you've got about a 400 millisecond latency. Uh, unfortunately, didn't this one drag after it? There's no latency after the first one is, is detected, so you can drag across there and see those X's move around. Okay, so that's, and I'll, we'll get to these ideas of how you might use this. So that's a series of different kinds of computational materials that are either self-sustaining, well, they're self-sustaining in the sense that they either use the phenomenon that they're sensing to generate the power, or they run at such low power that commodity harvesting techniques are enough to be able to power them in normal ambient indoor settings. So let's think about uh, applications, because as Weiser taught us, the only reason you should be interested in these new technologies is the extent to which they allow you to do interesting things from our, from our human experience. And the way I'm going to talk about this, and there are many more ideas than what I'm going to show you here, but I like to think about them in a number of different kinds of categories. The first is disposable, by which we mean that if you can make these things cheap enough and with materials that it's responsible enough to throw away or recycle, and they're not toxic, then what are some scenarios that allow you to think about disposable uh, um, applications of computational material? Or you might think about, well, I want these things to be around for a while, so it's not disposable, but I want to make it very easy to deploy them wherever I want them to be. And slightly related to easily deployed is some level of convenience that they convey. And what I'll try to demonstrate here is that because you can make these materials fairly thin and lightweight, you can do certain things that with things that are easier to carry around uh, um, on your body or around with you than you can with uh, uh, conventional technologies. And then the last category is, well, now I want to put these things somewhere where I'm not going to be able to get access to them very easily and they need to uh, be around for decades, so enduring case studies. So the first one was the what if that I gave you at the very beginning. So I hope you see the path from what I've already demonstrated, what things that we've already published, this kind of thin multi-material uh, wirelessly transmitting uh, uh, um, uh, material that leads us in the direction toward the post-it note that you tap and then can record a message, but simply translate that or, or uh, uh, transmit that um, uh, voice message somewhere else. Another scenario along these lines: uh, How many people here have an audio or a voice home assistant? Right? How many do you have in your house? <laughs> Raise your hand. How many do you have in your house? That was a bad way to say it. How many have more than one in your house? Okay, how many have bought an additional one because you wanted to have a, a, it more conveniently accessible uh, for where you wanted to say things, right? So what if instead of buying another Echo Dot or Google Assistant or whatever you want to call it, you could instead take a piece of paper and place it in your closet where you get dressed in the morning and want to know what the weather is, and that becomes a remote microphone to Alexa or Google or whatever. Right? So a, a way of providing a remote microphone to a service that you can deploy in uh, other places very, very, easy, very simply. Uh, this is not far off from what we're, we're talking about here. Let's take this case of, uh, and that's an example of easy deployment as well as a potentially uh, a disposable because maybe you don't want the microphone there all the time. 
Uh, but in the, in the case of easily deployed, let's think about the, the case of battery-free sensors. So here's an example of a vibration detector that plays the role of determining whether glass has been broken. And you can see here it's fairly bulky, that little box that's attached to the window, and it's wired to some security infrastructure so that an alarm uh, can be uh, struck. So not the kind of thing that would be easy to deploy uh, um, in a home. But if you instead, and remember I told you about the, um, the ability with these current patches that size of being able to harvest enough energy to flip a bit, right? Or harvest enough energy to flip a bit and, and communicate that bit of information. Uh, um, so here we could take a little patch, put it on the window, breaking of the uh, glass produces enough energy that will cause that patch to be able to communicate, hey, something happened here. We went over a threshold, likely the glass is broken. So that's one example of a, uh, a conventional glass break de uh, detector being replaced with that Zeus-like technology. Uh, the self-sustainable water sensor is an example. Um, that one I showed you, the original prototype, you can bend that. You could put some adhesion on it. You could wrap that around a pipe, put that under a sink. You could put that uh, um, in uh, building material uh, um, under the, the roof or in the basement. And as long as you could isolate the different patches, you could enable them to communicate, oh, water here, and by the way, I'm patch 247, I'm located in your basement, right? There's some programming that goes along with that, but we have the opportunity to deploy these kinds of uh, water sensors. But could you do this also for smoke? I'm pretty sure you can. Can you do this uh, for uh, uh, spoiled food? I talked about ammonia, I'm pretty sure you can. The question is, can we manufacture these at scale so that they're, they're very cheap to be able uh, to deploy? Another example of this easy deploy. Um, what we have up there at the top is an example of uh, in-car uh, control of the uh, media system. So what if I could essentially uh, uh, produce a piece of paper that has those same symbols on it, put that on the side of the, of the door in the back seat of the car, and now someone could touch there and essentially um, remotely control the particular uh, capabilities of that media system. Well, uh, what I showed you with that battery-free touch interface is that it was using ambient FM and need an FM receiver. Well, most cars uh, are in the presence of a reasonably good FM uh, 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 signal, that's why we use the FM radio, and they have an FM receiver uh, in there. So it's possible to be able to deploy something like this inside a, of, of a car. Uh, another example here, I talked about using this post-it note as a remote microphone, but maybe it could be one of those, uh, here are the things I want to be able to do, order new toothpaste, and I'll put that in the, in the cupboard uh, of, uh, in my, uh, by my vanity when I know when the toothpaste has run out, so I can just simply tap right there and have those kinds of lists that I, that I, that I could produce. Another uh, use case that maybe is a little more uh, compelling, uh, how many of you have traveled in a major airport in the last mm, year and a half? Okay. Have you walked into a restroom and walked out of that restroom and noticed a panel that looks something like this? You click a button here to indicate whether that whole restroom is, makes you happy, sad, or neutral. Uh, is there a problem with it, I think, is what they're trying uh, to communicate. Well, let's imagine instead we can attach a sticker to any of those particular items. So here is a light switch. There's a thermometer or thermostat. And you have these little stickers that if you tap it, that will send a message that that particular device needs servicing. So take the case of the restroom. Now, instead of expressing your impression of the entire restroom, you could say that soap dispenser is not working, that uh, um, towel dispenser is not working, that toilet is not working, or this wall is dirty. You could have these kinds of stickers and, and tapping, whether it's a simple tap or some uh, rhythm that you need to tap, you can provide that kind of feedback. And this is only interesting if it's easy to deploy these kinds of stickers everywhere and easily map their, the meaning of interacting with them to what message gets sent and provide the uh, um, infrastructure for that uh, wireless communication to occur. But I think these things are, are realizable. Something I didn't show you was some work we've been doing in combination of printed organics of, of combining harvesting uh, materials with sensing materials to provide thin, flexible surfaces that can act as depth imagers or a multi-touch surface. And they are self-sustaining in that the harvesting uh, uh, layer uh, produces enough energy for the, they, you don't need to produce much energy for the sensing to work, but you need to produce energy for that depth image to be communicated somewhere else. 
Now imagine the tiles in the ceiling in this, off, in this uh, um, uh, conference room had those kinds of depth sensors on them. So now you have a ceiling that's easily deployed that could do depth imaging of a volume below it. This is one particular example of that, but there are lots of examples where getting 3D imaging of, of a, a volume of space by easily deploying either things in the ceiling or on the walls might be of some value. Let's talk a little bit about convenience. So I said I was last here in 2010, and what I talked about was technology and autism, because as some of you may know, I have two boys on the autism spectrum, the oldest of which is a non-speaking individual. And fortunately, I've worked with him hard enough over the last couple years that he's now able to communicate by tapping on a keyboard. But that requires a communication partner, and it requires that communication partner to hold uh, uh, something. So initially, what I held was a laminated board, and my son Aiden could tap out letters on there to indicate that he understands what's being spoken to him or make a particular request. And then I would write down on a piece of paper. So he advanced to the point where I could hold a light wireless keyboard, and he would tap the key, and it would communicate the information to my phone, and that prevented me from having to write. It also makes my right shoulder extremely sore because those light wireless keyboards are not so light when you hold them for an hour with an individual. So if I could go back to the laminated board and turn that into a wireless keyboard, that would be much more convenient for me. Um, that's possible with that uh, uh, battery-free touch uh, um, surface that I, that I talked about before. Another example, uh, imagine I have a door that has an automatic or, uh, a lock on it, and I have an app on my phone that allows me to essentially unlock it by doing whatever, typing a, a pin or doing some imaging of a, some bio, biometric. Uh, um, now, wh what if I could place next to that door a little piece of paper, and on that paper is essentially a pad, and I tap the code, and that will send a signal that will open that door. Okay, this is like the remote control interface I talked about in the car. That interface can be in a variety of places. It doesn't have to be next to the door. It can be anywhere that I, that I want it to be. The last example I'm gonna show you is looking at the enduring use case. And I hope this tries to address a little bit about what you were saying, James, in terms of uh, why you wouldn't do this necessarily with conventional silicon-based technologies uh, because of their rigidity. So in a lot of industrial settings, you have industrial carpet. It's typically tiles of carpet. You could, uh, you could probably see if you look here, but Interface is one of the, uh, I think it's the, uh, the second largest uh, um, manufacturer of uh, industrial carpet. They have tiles that you place down. And they have a product they've had for over a decade now where they put RFID tags in the carpet tiles uh, so that when the carpet is cleaned, you can have a recording and evidence that the carpet was cleaned. In some settings, that's an important piece of information to do. How do they do that? Well, the big industrial uh, uh, cleaners have an RFID reader on them. And so as it goes over, it reads the, the tags and it reports where it, it has been. Uh, um, but what if I want to record something that doesn't have an RFID reader on it or very close to the tag, like a person walking over the tile? So take something like this material, which just detects a, uh, um, a, a, a pressure uh, my footstep now can generate enough energy to communicate out, oh, this tile has been stepped on. So now the carpet can track uh, uh, human uh, foot traffic over a, a particular space, which is interesting on a number of different dimensions. But let's take that one step further, because what's interesting about what I described is that with carpet, you could do this, and you would have anonymous tracking of, of uh, where people are. But let's think about a situation where you might want to actually know who is walking. So I mentioned I have uh, two boys on the spectrum. The younger one uh, was the runner in the family and would uh, go to, whenever we went to new places, uh, we would lose him. And uh, you might smile at that, but when you lose a child at Disney World or a big mall for an hour and he can't communicate effectively, that's a little harrowing. Um, so in addition to, now there's two things interesting about this particular scenario because in most malls, they're not carpeted. So now I'm thinking, how could you introduce this kind of triboelectric effect in floor materials like concrete or linoleum, uh, th those kinds of materials? That's the interesting uh, uh, case uh, in addition to carpet. But now let's use technologies like we had here. This is a, th a, a, a cylindrical cord, but it doesn't have to be that form factor. What if that was an insole in your shoe? And stepping on it produced enough energy to say, who 
was, uh, was stepping there. So now I have the, the floor that says I've been stepped on and a shoe that says, oh, by the way, it was Gregory. So now I, might, I put that in the insole of my child, or if I want to choose to put that in as an opt-in strategy, I now can track who was walking in particular places. Last example I'll give you, which I've already foreshadowed, is this notion of you see on the left there, uh, we produce huge amounts of these materials like Tyvek. Companies like DuPont or 3M produce these kinds of materials, and they produce them on the, at the rate of about eight square meters a second is how fast Tyvek uh, can be produced. And that's a wrap around a building to be a wind barrier and a water barrier, but not a sensor. So what if you could add the capabilities in addition to trying to be a wind barrier and a water barrier, it could indicate when it actually had to be a water barrier. There is a leak from, uh, from co coming outside it. Now you might say, why would people want to do that? At Georgia Tech, and I'm sure, well, is there a building here on campus that has a roof garden? I'm sure. You'd think in California you guys would have a, I mean, don't tell me we Atlantans are more hip than you uh, Silicon Valley folks, but you know, this isn't being recorded, but just between you and me, we may be. Uh, so one of our new buildings on campus has a roof garden. And when they built that roof garden, they were very concerned about leaking because, you know, they were going to be watering things up there, irrigating the life that, that's up there. So they created a very intricate uh, series of conductive rows and columns underneath that roof garden. And every day, someone, I don't know if it's every day or not, but occasionally someone goes with a little sensor and basically walks along the, the upper floor to see, are there any leaks underneath this particular building? Okay, so there are applications in which that uh, being able to produce an easy to deploy, cheaper, active form of water detection has some value. All right, so this is good. I have only a few more things to say and we have some time for you guys to, to comment. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple of uh, general lessons. Um, one of the ways I look at the world is in terms of generational shifts in technology. So uh, this particular paper uh, talks about four generations of technology. And, and, and you know, the first three are ones that others have mentioned. I just kind of regurgitate that. Um, so that third generation, that was Weiser's vision of ubiquitous computing, different scales of technology. And I noticed a few years ago that in the 2000s, there were a number of interesting technologies that I cleverly named Cloud, Crowd, Shroud, and Allowed, because that rhymes with ABOUT. Uh, that's not why I did it, but it does rhyme with my, uh, my last name. And it's four technologies since the fourth generation. By the way, I am foreshadowing the fifth generation. And how many examples did I give you? Total coincidence. Uh, um, so those are technologies that really, you could argue, Wiser did not foresee. And they have dominated how we think about it. I mean, a lot of the work that Michael does takes advantage of crowd as a programmable entity. And these are things that are just bread and butter of how we think about what m makes things interesting. What I proposed here were five different examples of computational material uh, uh, techniques, and that is what I consider to be a fifth generation, potential fifth generation of, of technologies, of computational materials. So what do I say a computational material is? It's a material that can harvest the power to do the things that a computer does. It could store information. It could compute logical operations. It could sense. I showed you lots of examples of sensing. I didn't show you any examples of actuation, but stay tuned. Uh, um, it can communicate within and between materials. And in addition, and this is probably the top part that it harvests the power is what's important, and this bottom part, that they're manufactured in large quantities at low cost and are used in everyday life to do interesting things. So those are computational materials. Um, second point. I want to put here is about thinking differently about how we can create a vision or realization of uh, ubiquitous computing that Wiser first uh, foreshadowed. Um, if you are driven by Moore's law, you think in terms of computers always getting smaller, always getting cheaper, and always getting more powerful. And that has been a phenomenal creative uh, um, uh, insight for people that for decades drove how we thought, particularly as researchers, about what we would want to create for the future. We could create bulky, near but not quite real-time demonstrations of things, and Moore's Law would take care of some of those things, and in a couple years, it would work. It would be cheaper, it would be smaller, it would run in real time, and we didn't have to worry about that. It just happened. So we envisioned things that were bulky that ultimately would not be bulky, that were expensive that ultimately would not be expensive, that didn't quite run as fast as we would want, but would run as fast as we want. 
Um, for the most part, we can't always live in that world anymore. But there's another way to think creatively. And that's to think that, well, these computational materials, these self-sustainable materials, are always going to get larger scale, meaning it'll be cheaper to produce them in mass quantities. And they'll become, as a result, will become more available. We can put them in lots more situations. So that's the second thought. The third thought is, how do you get there? Well, and here I'm talking mostly to the students. Uh, because your minds are still open to learning new things, though you get to my age and you tend to resist wanting to learn uh, new things. Uh, um, so James has just a couple more years before he will stop wanting to think about new things. But the way we got to a lot of these prototypes is by consulting experts in material science, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, which we as computer scientists have a reasonable relationship, computer architecture and design or, or, or HCI. You need to think more deeply about the materials and how they're manufactured to be creative if you care about the vision of these computational materials. And of course, I'm showing you some of my colleagues uh, at Georgia Tech who fall into the, those different categories. And together, we form the COSMOS team, which used to stand for something. But because it's so important, we don't care about the acronym anymore. We just care about the, the vision and the inspiration of COSMOS. You know, we're reaching for the stars. Uh, but as we all know, these are the people that actually did all the work. And uh, these are the people that take all the credit. Right? Last. The uh, note I'm going to pr provide for you is that these computational materials, these simple things that I demonstrated to you, by themselves are not that impressive. It only becomes impressive if you can manufacture and deploy them at large scale. And then I think something truly amazing can happen, possibly truly worrying as well. Um, so what I think we're on the cusp of is an alternative to our standard computing industry. And the question is, how is it going to emerge? Is it going to be the intels of the world that will decide to create different kinds of computational devices? Or will it be the DuPonts and the Cornings of the world that manufacture goods and, and are, are familiar with these mass production and decide, oh, we want our goods to be computational? Or is it going to be some young whippersnapper or, or a few who is going to have a, a great idea and she will produce an example of a computational material that will take off and will overtake uh, uh, the Apples and Facebooks and Googles of the world? Interesting, but I think it might happen in the next five to 10 years. So with that, I will thank you.